So welcome everybody. This is the session on building diverse teams and projects. Uh, obviously, as if you were here for the kickoff this morning, it's it's a, a big passion of mine. Um, sort of as somebody who's had to build communities in the past um, and who's really had to build uh, diverse teams. And especially now in my role at, at, at Oasis Open, I'm trying to build our team to be a little more diverse than it is. It's kind of <laughs> kind of uh, the opposite of diverse at the moment, but we're working on that. And I think that this is going to be a great session for us to kind of talk about some of the 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 challenges that that arise, or and, and also some of the um, some of the strategic things as well as some of the kind of the tactical things you can do as you think about building uh, a, a diverse team, whether it's a community or 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 a a project. So one of the things I wanted to do was in doing the research for this. You know, I looked at a lot of different uh, articles, and, and the good thing is you can Google this and see a tremendous amount of articles on building diverse teams, right? I mean, I think it's, it's great to be living in a time where, where we really have a lot of resources for these sorts of things, so that's fantastic. So I, I found an article that I want to start with that kind of give, they had eight ideas or eight thoughts about how you think about building diverse teams and projects, and I thought those would kind of form maybe the bones of, of the discussion and maybe hopefully oh. lead us in some interesting directions. So. Um, the eight things were, number one, think about diversity from the start. Makes sense, right? It would it seem like it would be easier uh, to do this rather than trying to retrofit it into an existing organization like I'm trying to do now. Um, address all aspects of diversity. And this one really resonates with me because it's not just about um, you know, uh, representative diversity. It's about cognitive diversity, people who think differently from other people. Um, you know, it's about socioeconomic diversity. There's a lot of factors that are involved here rather than just gender identity or, or other things. Um, number three was improve your recruiting strategy. So I'd love to dive into that one uh, if people have ideas around that. Um, celebrate employee differences. So really actually giving employees an opportunity to kind of have their own cultural uh, affinity groups or other things that help celebrate their differences. Stop and listen to your employees. Again, a really, really important one. And I think one that um, personally now that, that I've got a sort of a different role than I had at Autodesk where I was more of a, a senior individual contributor and now I'm leading an entire organization. This is a big one for me. It's one of the ones I really try to work on um, a lot is listening to my employees and kind of their thoughts on these things. Um, the next one is provide leadership development opportunities. So really, really important. I think especially not just in, in um, kind of training opportunities, but providing opportunities, encouraging um, folks, whether it's in your community or in your organization to go, you know, put a talk, put a talk proposal and help them see if they can get that talk proposal accepted. Those are really, really important things. Um, improve your own leadership skills. Uh, John knows this one really well because he's my go-to resource for this. We, we have many a conversation about improving leadership skills. So I think this is really, really important. Um, kind of as you be, hopefully become a stronger leader, you can be a better leader of, of diverse uh, uh, and inclusive teams. And then finally, the other one that John and I both like, evaluate your efforts, right? How do you know you're improving um, your diversity? And, and, and I think you have to evaluate it not from just the perspective of, okay, how many women do I have in my organization? How many you know, people of color do I have in my organization? It's it's really a broader based thing around those things. Plus, you know, are you having um, better conversations? Are you having impact um, with regard to how employees, you know, view your organization? So um, those things, I think, as I looked at it, I, I really thought this was a great place to start to basically say any of any or all of those, happy to have people thoughts and discussions on this. And did we get a volunteer to take notes? It would be great if we could. Anybody? Oh, yeah. uh, Ray asks if I have a link. Let me take. Let me grab that link for you, Ray. <clears throat> so we currently have an, an anonymous armadillo, buffalo, <laughs> aquabara, whatever that is, a chameleon, and an anteater in the dark. So, <laughs> if, if if those of you who are in there can take notes, that would be wonderful because then we can we, we can share them with the broader CLS crowd. Capybara is the largest rodent. They live in Venezuela. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. Important, important things. Uh, Ray, the, I just put the link into entrepreneur.com, the article that I found this info from. So with that, i uh, love to kick it off for folks to kind of weigh in on any of those things or something different. Well, 
I, I guess hey, I can freezer. say something. Um, well, first of all, it's it's amazing to uh, to be in a session with Nithya again because just like Jana was sort of my um, entry to community architecting, Nithya was very much. Um, the, the groundbreaking kind of force behind me starting to talk about diversity and inclusion. And um, Nithya has constantly lended her, her credibility and her platform to me and so many people to talk about this really important subject. And uh, so I just think sharing the stage, whenever you get it, I mean, Nithya and Guy, you as well, are amazing at getting talks accepted at things. And you're also very amazing at bringing people along that aren't always getting talks accepted or that are too shy, you know, normally, and really encouraging different voices of the community to find their voice. And I just, Nithya, you're the best at it. And you've, you've done it for me so many times. And it's, it's just such an honor to be here with you again. Oh gosh, thank you. But, but you know, um, Lisa Murray, you have really brought the voice to the table and reminded us of the need to champion, need to include people uh, across the world and across, you know, different dimensions like Guy was mentioning. Um, and there's a famous saying, you know, people are over, women and others are over mentored, under championed, mm -hmm. under sponsored. And, and I think uh, the point that Guy made about uh, sponsoring and championing people and leading by example is so critical. Uh, mentoring is just giving advice, but sponsoring is truly opening doors. I think people are reading a lot more about DE and I these days. Um, I, uh, I have a talk at Open Source Summit coming up next week that we recorded last week. And the E part is so important. Google it if you don't know about this and learn about it because, you know, diversity, yeah, we, you know, we've got, we all understand what that means and bringing different types of, of people and thought and inclusion is, you know, in including those people. But the equity part of that is really documenting that there is inequality and making yourself accountable to do something about it, something tangible about it. And that's what I'm pushing corporations to do these days. And I encourage people when you're talking about DNI to talk about DE and I, because we have a lot of people talking and not a lot of action. So that's where the accountability comes in. Yeah, that's empowerment, Lisa Marie? Uh, equity, diversity, equity, uh, equity and inclusion. Equity. I'll put yeah. some notes in afterwards. I'm just not good at talking and writing at the same time. Okay. I'll put a no, link to a really fantastic. good article in. Actually, I'll go grab that now. Okay. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. So uh, other folks want to weigh in. And, and as Jono mentioned, you can be a panelist or we can just enable your audio if you're shy and don't want to show your video, which is also fine. But we'd, we'd love to have you, uh, anybody else chime in or chime in and chat as well. We're actually watching that as well. We have anonymous speaker. I love how in Zoom we have speaker and Jono is ATO, 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 and then anonymous speaker. I kind of like to do that at one point, anonymous speaker. Okay, well, I, yeah, that's the thing, right? Some, somebody's got to speak up because otherwise you're gonna have to listen to me drone on, which is never a, never a fun, fun topic, but um, uh, as we're waiting, unless somebody wants to jump in and interrupt me, let me just pull this right. other part from the article, because I think as I was reading through the article, uh, one of the things I really liked was um, the improve your recruiting strategy section. So they talk about a couple of things in here. Rethink the language you use in job postings. That's a big one. And I know that there's actually, I believe, some software now that will go through and look at text or job postings and figure out, okay, what things are, are um, actually putting in unconscious bias um, to people of color or underrepresented groups in job postings. So I think that's a fantastic uh, thing to be looking at. Um, they have some other ones, some suggestions, cast a wider net. Uh, that's always one that, that can sometimes be tough depending upon what skill set there is, but um, you know what you're looking for, but obviously casting a wider net is, is huge. Uh, I know at, at Autodesk, we actually had a policy before I left where um, if they didn't get enough candidates from underrepresented groups, they relisted the position, which I thought was an interesting, it was an interesting way to, to look at that. Um, uh, overcoming unconscious bias. This is a big one, and there's there's a link here to Harvard's implicit association test to become aware of kind of your unconscious biasness, unconscious biases, 
And uh, I know Lisa Marie knows and, and my partner Nicole knows that's a huge one for me because it was a, it, it's kind of a big, bigger story that I'm going to talk about later today at, at two in my session around not realizing some of the unconscious biases I did have. So um, those are just, I think, some strategies for improving your recruitment strategy. So love to have other people touch on any of those uh, recruitment strategy or, or, or any of the other uh, eight that I mentioned from this article. So anybody else want to want to chime in on that? Guy, I can say something about that. Again, I don't want to just like have everybody just be only hearing from me, but um, you know, I just went through kind of all summer a long job hunt process, and I talked to a lot of companies, um, and also as a you know community organizer, we always are talking to a lot of companies, and people are really looking at this as a metric of whether they want to join the company or not. And you're seeing a couple of CEOs recently in the news, kind of on the hot seat for. Um, for very apolitical language that they've put in public blogs that basically say, you know, we're not going to take a stand on anything at our company. And this isn't, you know, the job from top down. And there's lots of different ways to do that. In a lot of the companies I talked to, um, there was a, a CPO, a chief people officer or a chief you know, programs uh, process officer. And that person is really sometimes recruiting falls under that team. Um, and they're, they're actually hiring for these positions to put a lot of focus in this area. But what I have found is when that role um, and uh, Nithya, Lauren Mafio talks about this all the time. So I should really give her credit for this because she makes the point on, on my next panel. That role should not report up to HR. That diversity, chief diversity officer, first of all, I'm not, you know, it, I'm not a huge fan of that role anyway, because it should be everybody's responsibility to be thinking about these things at the company. But if you are going to have a role like that, in order to empower that person to be successful, they have to report into the CEO. They have to report into the, and they have to have metrics that are accountable all the way up to the board level, because otherwise they're not going to get the funding to do it. And there's not going to be that top down approach that you really, really need. And then at that point, you know, decisions can be made um, about how to empower employees to all go and do that thing that we all need to do, whether it's giving them time off so they can, you know, be a poll worker and register people to vote or giving time off to go march or, you know, let, letting people choose what's important to them and the causes that may matter to them. And then instead of having, a CEO that cares, you have a multi thousand person company that cares and is empowered to actually do something and make change. Now, that's, that's a great point. That's a great point, Lisa Marie. Um, I'm actually trying to convince Salona Paul to become a pan to, to jump up to be a panelist because she had some great points in chat here. Um, one of which I think related to the whole job thing is that we've heard often that that you know uh, women tend to want to have 100 percent of the qualifications before they will apply to a job versus men who will do it when they're 60 percent and and i'm not sure that that's just kind of a a cultural thing but i think it's something that that as you're you're reaching out you need to be thinking about um and sloan has a great point if you put in required if you think about what your balance of required uh, elements to a job is versus preferred um kind of maybe flipping that around a little bit maybe helps you get a little bit uh wider reach um can i and then, can i add to that yeah, absolutely go ahead like one of the other things we do in all of our job postings is to say even if you don't qualify for all of these uh requirements please apply because we want to talk to you and and to kind of educate people that to your point that not all of these are required sometimes people just tend to put everything in the kitchen sink in their job requirements and and you need to you know, decide if you have 40, 50, that's okay. And you can sh demonstrate how you can learn the rest of it. Right, it, it, it's a great point. Um, and Salona, since you made the comment about we're focusing on role diversity, I would love to hear your thoughts because I agree, it, it's sometimes hard when it feels like you're fishing in a pool that, that to your point is 95% white guy. Yeah, so. Right. Um, so one of the things that I, I tried to get done more at PayPal, and it was kind of iffy as to how well I could do that, was looking outside of the normal pool of applicants. And so expanding out that job hunt where you didn't just do the normal checks and um, checkoffs that everyone was doing. Instead, you focused more on the actual skills that you were looking for, not sitting there saying you had to have done blah, blah, blah. Instead, it's like you have the skill of this. And focusing it that way changed a lot. Like someone in the th chat just sat there and said the whole point about um, the uh, degrees hurting uh, and things of that nature. It's true, especially like if you look at me, I didn't actually get a computer science degree. 
I went back to school and did a bunch of computer science courses, but that's not what I did because I graduated in 92 and they're just, it just wasn't the thing. Um, though I did do decision theory, so there was that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's like, you have to sit there and look at that from that perspective. And the other thing that I do is I look for other, you know, greater diversity in regards to the roles where, you know, when I was looking at product managers, it's, it wasn't just, are you a coder? It was, have you led things? How have you led things? What have those things looked like? And even tapping into people who knew more about marketing or other different things, because when it's a product, you really need to understand your users and stuff of that nature. So it's expanding the scope. Cool. I think there is a, there is also a big a big point in the seniority of people that you you want to hire. Um, even more in in IT, where if you look for a senior or like people with a lot of experience, obviously you will lack a lot of diversity in your pool of candidates. Where if you look for a more junior position, that's where you start to be able to have a more diverse pool of of candidates. And um, so you have to also try to make some trade offs there, and maybe hire more for the potential and more for someone that you will help build. Uh, than someone that would be effective directly in your team. Right. Uh, I did actually want to bring a question that uh, Ray Pike, Pike asked here uh, in chat. Can we talk more about casting a wider net? And I think, Salona, you sort of touched on it. Is, is it exploring more and new channels or reaching out to a different audience? Honestly, I'm doing both. <laughs> So on the open source side of things with the platform that I'm creating at IEEE, I've got a community advisory group and a marketing advisory group. And then for the technology advisory group, we're adding in architectural reviews, design reviews, you know, product management tools so that I can bring in all of these other roles. So it's not just about the code. Um, it's about all of the different things that people have to contribute. Um, when I was doing the hiring at um, PayPal, one of the things that I actually hired the most for was maturity and resilience. Uh, because when it comes down to the tech, it's going to keep changing. All these things are going to keep happening. How fast do you learn? How well, how good of a learner are you? You know, are you mature about doing that? You know, can, can you, can you stay on path? And then secondly, can you deal with all of the hurdles corporate life is going to throw at you? You know, the fact that now your path is not from here, it's not A to B, it's like, oh, first you have to go to C and then you got to go over to D and then maybe F will give you the okay and then you can actually go through and do it. I have to look for other um, things beyond the normal thing as do you know Java? Um, do you know Java only gets you so far in the corporate world? You actually have to have a lot of other types of skills that need to be necessary. And, and to be quite honest, the majority of the time, I'm a little egotistical because I did you know, teach at a collegiate level, but I can teach you that um, if you have a certain type of um, mind and personality. And so that's what I looked for more was those other characteristics. Right. Guy, another aspect of casting a wider net is all of us diversifying the number of people and the type of people we know. Sometimes if you look at your LinkedIn uh, network, you'll find that they're very homogeneous. They tend to be all people who look like you, and you really, really need to intentionally diversify the people you know on Twitter and LinkedIn and other networks so that you can actually go recruit people from other groups versus, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point, Nithya. This morning I was watching those keynotes and I immediately reached out to all the speakers on LinkedIn and LinkedIn. And I would encourage everybody who's on this call, reach out to Shedrach. He was he was so excited and he wrote me a personal note. You know, reach out on LinkedIn, you know, connect with, with all of those. There's so many people at this conference. Um, they've done a great job with a really diverse group of speakers. So I would say go on LinkedIn and reach out with everybody and connect. And another thing um, that we do, so we run a hackathon program and we use a, a like a I don't know broker a company to to set those all up for us and we we asked them instead of going to the usual suspects you know Stanford MIT all the IVs we said we want you to focus on um, junior colleges on public schools on historically black colleges and on state schools 
And they, they couldn't believe it. They'd never got that request before, which made me really sad that people aren't asking for those type of things. But you really got to push your vendors, you know, to extend the reach of these programs out to places where the people just don't think to, to, to extend that reach to. Yeah, definitely. So does anybody else want to chime in on the casting the wider net piece? I, I definitely want to, if that's an area that, that we want to explore as a group, I'm happy to, to dive further into that. But I also want to see if anybody else, anything resonates with any of those other uh, eight that I mentioned from this article around building diverse teams. Because I mean, we could probably talk two hours on, on some of the challenges around um, casting a wider net. So um, yeah, and Nithya says we're fishing in the same ponds and we need to expand where we recruit. And that was your point, Lisa Marie. I think it's a great point. So anybody else want to chime in on this topic or sure. anything um, else? Thing, yeah, Andy, go ahead. One thing I learned at an earlier community leadership summit that I attended several years ago was to really kind of get involved with like um, different niche um, developer professional groups. Like I belong to Girl Geek Dinners and the Women's Coding Collective and a bunch of places like that. And if you even just kind of reach out to the groups and say, I've got a job, it's a good way to start at least the conversation. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, totally. Nithya, on um, the remote work. Oh, oops. I only sent it to, oops. I only sent it to Sorry. all panelists. Um, so remote work is just, I think, crucial for a lot of this. Um, you know, on my team right now that I have, I've got a bunch of moms. I've got a bunch of, uh, right now I've got, I've got an idea. I've got an amazingly diverse team right now. In fact, we were like teasing two of the guys that we have our two token white guys, um, <laughs> because we've got people of color and women and you know all, all kind of diverse, handicapped, all, all sorts of different things that we're you know working on, and remote work helps with that so much in that they can still do all the things that they do. Um, especially like if you do deal with any um, handicapped individuals who have energy issues or things of that nature so that they can parse their work out and show their completion of everything. And that's one thing that I think that's so beautiful about the remote work is it becomes more about not how much time you spent on something, but what you actually did and what your deliverables are. And I think that's a really crucial piece to explain in regards to that. So um, yeah, I'm a huge fan of the remote work because with remote work, it's not about FaceTime. It's about, you know, what, you, what you've actually turned in. Right, and, and, and Sloan, that's a great point. And I, I just wonder as a small side note, and we can come back to the main topic if you want. As we're going through COVID and remote work literally becomes the norm, are there other aspects of what we're going through with COVID that affect how you build a diverse team, right? It, either positive or negative. Yeah, for me, I, um, I'm benefiting <laughs> um, and completely taking advantage of all these people who got laid off. So I have to admit, I'm, you know, I found out from a bunch of people who I can do part time and how they can do part time because they're also having to deal with the kids and all these other different issues. And so it's basically making sure that a bunch of people um, do not become homeless, are fed well. All, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not underpaying anyone. Okay, no mm -hmm. underpayment of anyone but at the same time, creating that balance for everyone on that so that they can actually accomplish all the different things that they need to accomplish during this extremely difficult time. Um, because everybody's got so many new burdens that they, they hadn't dealt with before. Right, right. definitely. I have a question um, for the group. Just one of the, one of the items listed in the article that you shared, Guy, that really kind of jumps out at me was this, <clears throat> Was number four, which is celebrating employee differences, um, and I'd love to hear any anyone who's who's done this and any tips and tricks that they would recommend for how to do that effectively. Because I can imagine with some employees, I mean, obviously, though, I would assume that um, if you're celebrating the differences with your employees, you'd want to make sure that they're obviously comfortable with that. That you're not celebrating differences that they don't want to necessarily discuss. So I'm just cur curious how people have celebrated those differences. And it can be not necessarily in a company, it could be in an open source project or elsewhere in a way that um, has been participatory um, and just any techniques like practical ways, maybe in Slack or in ISC or in email or anything like that. 
Jono, know, a couple of uh, uh, answers on that. One is um, finding a variety of ways to get their input and connect with them, right? I, I think you role modeled it very well saying, not everyone needs to be on video. If you feel more comfortable putting your answer on chat versus speaking, then that's great. And this also applies to the way we celebrate as teams. Sometimes in the past, we used to always default to, let's go for a drink in the evening. Right. And many people can't do an evening drink. Maybe they don't drink. Uh, maybe they have to go back to take care of their kids. And yeah. so finding a diff variety of ways so people, all of them can participate is important, I think. And second is, as a manager, as a leader, knowing the strengths and weaknesses of your team and putting them in the right role so they all shine is, is so, so important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Nithya. Any other experience or recommendations? I'm just sorry, I'm resharing the article and everything for Neil and for anybody else who may have just joined. Yeah, and just um, again, just the uh, this is uh, I keep reminding people throughout these sessions. If you do want to join this group as a panelist, everyone, I know some people have been joining a bit later. Just uh, just type into the chat, and I'm happy to add you. Uh, you can either just speak with your mic, or you can put your video on as well. It's completely your choice. So if you want to do that, just make sure when you do that, type in. Um, just make sure that you select where the blue box is in the chat in Zoom, panelists and attendees. Otherwise. Mm -hmm. Sometimes only some people will see it. So yeah. Uh, so I, I, John, I'll kind of a, a little bit echo uh, Nithya's point. I know when we when I was at Autodesk, they actually had uh, affinity groups, and I know it, it kind of just depends. I think on the employer, and it also depends on maybe the culture of the company. That seemed to work pretty well, honestly, at Autodesk. Is you know we had a, affinity groups for um, African Americans. We had affinity groups for somebody mentioned you know trans and, and gender fluidity. We had affinity groups for that. And I think it was um, it was it worked out really well at Autodesk. And and again, I'm not sure if it's company culture or just kind of where they were from, you know, how they were as as a progressive organization. But you know, I had I, I did um, I did a couple of panels at some of our internal events where um, we had people who were non-binary. We had you know women. We had we had all sorts of different folks on that. And, and I think that was a testament to just kind of the the culture that was was put into that uh, those efforts as an organization, and they were very active on Slack. I mean, I ran a Slack instance at Autodesk, and we had those affinity groups had huge numbers uh, in their channels. So, I think that was a good example of of celebrating that. Um, but I'd love to hear others. I think there's a gentleman called Goyal who wants to share or be a panelist, yeah. perhaps. I'm gonna, or or John, I can do it, or John can do it, either one. Sorry, what was that, Nithya? Uh, a person called Goyal Goyal wants to share oh. his thoughts or their ship thoughts. Sorry, let me do that right now. Let me add you. Yeah, you can add them. Okay. So someone brought up the issue of trans um, here. Uh, one of the things that, so we have two trans people on our team. And one of the things that um, I think is important is I would right now hate to try to force my trans employees to move to Texas. Um, I would prefer, you know, Austin is lovely. I love Austin. I, I hate to say it, but I'm sixth generation Texan. Um, right now I feel kind of ashamed, but I would not try to request for, for them to move. Um, and so that they get to stay in a place that's friendlier, that has better trans rights in their state, that they have all of that. You won't be able to do that if you forced everyone to, to be in person. Uh, Goyo, you wanted to share, or Anjali, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just corrected my name. Uh, hi, all. Thank you for adding me. So it's really great to be a part of this uh, forum and having such great speakers. I hope you all can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Hey, great. Okay, so I, I'll just introduce myself. I'm from India and I've just joined in. I just uh, saw a lot of tweets about this, all things open. So I joined in and I lot of good speakers so here I am and uh, so I have been basically since the last year I've been just want to uh, just want to uh, share my views about the job opportunities what I have faced uh, since the last year so uh, I just left the organization in 2019 
and was doing good so after that i just decided to venture into uh, into one of my portfolio which is into sda networking and uh, Uh, something related to nfe and i started studying and exploring that uh, option uh, networking with different people and all and then started uh, looking for jobs so i applied for a lot of jobs and opportunities in various organizations tried approaching various different people so i just found that uh, uh, like whenever i tried in india so in india the problem was that they have been always been looking for the people uh, who have been inside so they have been pro- generally organization pro- promote people who are inside so generally the positions are filled through the inside people itself so this is what one of the problem which i have been facing then when i went outside to some other some other places like to the north america or some to europe so there i have just i just felt that there uh, i've been applying to a lot of uh, job opportunities is and and uh, trying my best to uh, update my resumes as per the uh, as per their uh, job descriptions but i found that my job uh, my resume was not even getting shortlisted so i have been getting the responses that uh, uh, you're not eligible for this or you are not shortlisted uh, you don't look like a good fit instead of being from the marketing profile or from the technical profile i was not getting shortlisted so i have a 9 years of experience in telecom world i worked with nokia infinera and uh, coriant and i've been into the pre sales i've been part of the pre sales roles answering all the uh, rfps rfis working with all the plms the executives then uh, working in infinera and korean as in marketing profile but then i wasn't getting shortlisted anywhere so i was just trying to find out what is the reason why i am not getting shortlisted so uh, uh, i yeah yeah well, i hope know, i'm not could, going out of uh, well you know it, here's the thing it, it could be a variety of things and obviously no, we don't know your situation i mean um and but you bring up an interesting point about i think cultural bias right and potential you know depending on on the kinds of roles that you're going for or the the companies that you're applying to if there's you know a cultural bias against you as a person is there a cultural bias against you know your age ageism is a, is a thing so i i'm actually not sure really how to answer that i'd love to have any of the okay. other panelists or anybody here kind of have have kind of put their two cents in for this I would just say stay positive and hang in there. There like Guy just said there are a lot of reasons why people don't get jobs and you know I just spent a whole summer not getting jobs and uh, and I know a lot of people and I'm really networked and I thought I was very qualified for all of them. Um there's just a lot of reasons you don't always know but just stay really positive, keep at it. It's just a lot of work. and just you know keep you know just do all your research but your network is is the most important thing everyone says that but it's really very true you know those mentors and and who your network is is what open doors for you and then also people can coach you on specific opportunities that you're going into so that's probably the most important thing and the thing that's always helped me the most sure thank you so much thank you so much lisa and guy martin for your thoughts it's really helpful stay positive attitude is everything stay positive yeah yes absolutely. definitely <laughs> thank you yeah i am again i'm working on my <laughs> on my skills oh, absolutely I, i think the the Go point ahead, about having a network is is quite interesting if you um, put it in perspective with uh, open source co- communities because when you start to contribute to a community and like start to get to know people that's also how you start to build uh that talk and start to know people that you would not really uh have opportunities to to work with or chat with and that brings the topic on how to make those communities more diverse also and how to bring more diversity into the, those communities because i i think uh, definitely at at red hat uh we use a lot the communities to actually hire people and if our communities are not diverse we also don't have this like diverse group to to hire people so i've been interested in thoughts about like how how you promote and how you get more uh, more diversity in a in an open source community sure 
Thank you, Clement, for your comments. Definitely. Ooh, how you get more diversity in our open source community? <laughs> it seems I, I'm only chuckling because it seems like uh, throughout this, everyone, almost everyone that's on this panel that I know, and I know most of you, it, it's it seems like this is a constant topic that comes up, right? And I, and I think it's for me, it's two things. One is it's as Sloan says, kind of going outside of what would be the normal audience, right? And and I have to say this as an engineer who kind of writes code for fun now, not for a living. You know, I was probably guilty of, as Nithya says, kind of looking for more engineering folks. But I think, you know, Nithya has done a great talk, and I think Lisa Marie's done a great talk on marketing in open source, right? And I think somebody mentioned earlier, marketing isn't, you have to get the techies to understand that marketing isn't a dirty word because you build the best tech in the world and it's not marketed in a way that other people are going to want to use it, especially in open source communities. It's really, really difficult. Jono, I know you've had a lot of had a lot of things you've talked about around how to get people into on ramps into communities and, mm -hmm. and, can you maybe talk about that yeah. as it relates to diversity? Yeah, happy to. And by the way, I need to make an apology because I've been a little bit distracted um, without boring you all with my housekeeping, but I was supposed to be in another session while this was going on. <laughs> I, I had no idea about this. And then they said, there's a bunch of us sitting in the session waiting for you. There was some scheduling issue, So I was just taking care of that while <laughs> we've all been discussing. So my apologies for looking distracted. Um, one, um, I, one thing that I find I found quite interesting, and this kind of relates to diversity, but I think it it really relates to the relationship between I think people and their leaders is just um, like psychologically, there's quite a lot of research on mimicry, like where, where people mimic their leaders. So if you get really aggressive, nasty leaders, then that can often resonate in people who who are the I don't like the word subordinates, but you know people who who are who are within that grouping. Um, but if you get really kind, empathetic leaders, then you can you get that in the folks as well. And I think this is where, to me, it's really important, especially in open source, that we, we don't just pick leaders who are the people with the most time or the people who started the project. Um, one thing that really bugs me is, and I see this a lot in Silicon Valley, which is near where I live, is this mentality of, um, yeah, they're kind of a-holes, but they're really good. And I just don't like that viewpoint. Like, I don't think just because you're really technically proficient at something that it's okay to be mean and um, uh, non-collaborative with people. And I think we need to start getting rid of this notion. And I think that I don't want to pigeonhole Silicon Valley too much, but I think the tech world and especially the early stage venture backed tech world celebrates that mentality too much. So to me, and we should be celebrating someone's EQ as much as their, as much as their IQ. And, um, I, and my view is like, if you have great leaders and especially people who are more representative of the community, I, I love seeing how the, the growth of people of color and trans folks and, and women in leadership positions in tech, then I think that is how we help bridge that gap. It's my personal view. Yep, yep. I agree, John. I did want to go back. Uh, Evan asked a question, a great question about governance. Um, so I put it in chat, but let's read it quickly if folks haven't seen it. What about governance? What are the best places to find people with governance skills that many tech people seem to actively shun? I I'm only laughing because I'm a tech person that had governance skills and that just it actually is a great, <laughs> for those that want, for those that want to find interesting jobs, it's an interesting mix. Uh, and I'm an odd engineer that I have the governance skills, but um, where do you find people that have active governance skills and do you compensate directors? So I'd love to hear other thoughts from, from the panel or, or anyone else out there on that. So obviously, as you know, Guy, I have much to say. <laughs> I, I figured you did, because we haven't talked about this at all. So, no, know, we don't talk about this at all, right? <laughs> so at IEEE, um, one of the main things that we're working on is this piece right now. And so with this new platform that we're creating with GitLab is we're like, how do we make governance easier? How do we automate it more? How do we do all of those different things? So it isn't such a struggle every single time. And so we're actually, and it's kind of like the interesting merging, you know, because you also were both in the standards world, you know, governance is king. Um, 
how do we merge that better with open source and all the different things that we're doing? And so that's one of the things that we're working on right now with our platform is going, oh, okay, how do we make sure that first of all, all the IPR stuff is taken care of? How do we make sure that meetings are run correctly so that we don't have to worry about antitrust issues? How do we do all of these different things? And since IEEE is all about that, um, you know, to a crazy extent, actually to a crazier extent than Guy's group, which is Oasis. <laughs> I think Oasis is a little bit more friendlier and fluid sometimes than IEEE can be. Um, and so we're very much so working on how do we do that for the community at large so that you can take care of these things more easily and not have it bog you down as much. Um, <clears throat> for the other governance skills in regards to directors, I have to admit we haven't been. Um, IEEE is, is 501c3, 100% volunteer driven. Um, we've just been lucky in regards to the, the reputation. And so when people sit there and think that marketing doesn't matter, <laughs> it does if you want those people. Um, right. So uh, you do need to make sure that you have that kind of stuff available or else you won't get those people. And you do want them because do you know who gets you money and gets you support at your company? <laughs> those people. Marketing people. So, yeah. Yeah. No, it's a great, it's a great point. And, and I love the fact that you folks are doing that with the platform. I, I mean, uh, Evan says, you know, they have a, the PMI, a PMI grad on staff and it's extremely useful. The automation is obviously fantastic and it's a great way to do it, but it, it doesn't, I don't think it's a full, a full substitute for finding those people with, again, more of those diverse right. governance type of backgrounds. So it, 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 is there a place that you go look, you know, governance, governance RS? I don't know. I mean, it, it seems so, to me that for me, it's mostly my network of folks that I look at that, that do that kind of role because I kind of naturally gravitate to that role. But I'm wondering if there's other places that we should be looking. Well, one of the sneaky things that we're doing on the platform is we're measuring it. And we're also giving them an avenue by, you know, working on these best practices and um, going towards standards where we do actually have a reward model for them. You know, we have incentives, incentives. Um, that they might not normally get out of a normal open source project because a lot of times the coders aren't friendly to that kind of those type of people coming in at first. And so by going through and incentivizing them, uh, I think they will come um, if you if you do more of that. And then, you know, there is, like I said, the marketing issue. Uh, they find out they believe in your goals. They want to do different stuff, you know. I don't know how many times a governance person has like landed in my lap because they cared so much about the issue. Um, and as the, Candy just says here, um, nonprofit board training. Um, I was on the, the um, board of directors for TANA, the Texas Association of Nonprofit Orgs. They have a whole system for how to go in there and get those people. So go grab those nonprofit people. Because like I said earlier, that's who I hired a lot of for doing this new project was nonprofit people, not open source. Um, but I felt like I could teach them those pieces, but it's hard to teach that ethos. And right. so if you grab those people who already have that sharing, wanting to be transparent ethos, then I think you can, right. you can travel faster. Awesome. So, Hey, we have a couple of minutes left and, uh, the speaker who put the, the last link in for panelists, Vicki, is that actually you? Cause have no, no, it's Deb. Deb. Oh, it's Deb. Oh yeah. Hi. Okay. Um, it is Vicky's thing. I didn't know if my, I can't tell it says me. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it says for you. Um, I raised my hand because uh, I was gonna. I was gonna kind of echo what she was just saying. Is that if you can't actually get nonprofit folks to come work for you and be on your board, although that's good, um, there are folks that um, do consulting that will help you do a lot of the things that nonprofits do, like strategic planning. We're using someone great right now over at the Open Source Initiative. And uh, some of the other stuff, like, you know, hire a fundraising person who's maybe like from, you know, fundraising and not from open source. There's uh, a lot of different ways that you can bring people in. Cool. And that whole, Thanks. That, Thanks, re so. that repo is all uh, fast governance uh, resources. So like documents and code of conduct uh, examples and things like that. Nice. Oh, and now I have to now I have to chuckle because uh, Jamie Clark, my my uh, general counsel for Oasis, is on and, and says he hearts Vicky in her webpage, which is awesome because we all do, because Vicky is awesome. Um, about a minute left here. Anybody want to uh, add anything on this or any of the other eight things? The only the only thing I would love to, if we have an opportunity here in the last minute, is to talk about evaluating your efforts. 
because I think that's something we haven't covered. And it's really, really important, at least to me, about how you kind of make sure you're making progress in these efforts. So anybody want to comment on that aspect? Well, just like we always talk about documentation and documenting all of these processes, that should be part of the charter of your group, your organization, your company, whatever it is. So those metrics should include diversity, equity, and inclusion metrics and documented. I mean, yeah. I mean, do you have examples, right? <laughs> Lisa Marie, do you have like examples of what those metrics would look like? Well, I, it's like I put you on the spot. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Well, the community that I'm running here is more of a user group and it's not developing an open source code. It's, you know, it's cloud native containers um, in the Bay Area. We have physical meetings and all of that. So, um, and I've been running it for eight years and I haven't had a lot of other people to like document and pass it off to. So I'm probably not the best um, unless you're talking about from a corporate standpoint, in which case, yes, it's part of our OKRs. It's part of our metrics that go all the way up to the board and there's accountability at the C level for it in corporations. Um, but if you're speaking about specifically in um, software, open source software communities, I think somebody else should probably speak to that documentation. Yeah, the Chaos Project and Nicole are, are doing, you know, a lot of work around yeah. how to track the diversity of, uh, of open source projects, particularly in leadership and other positions, not just the number of people coming into the funnel but are they also growing with the organization and you know, being given a chance to grow? Uh, I would also say uh, companies need to continue to be transparent and share all of their diversity numbers. Uh, companies in Silicon Valley used to do it and then they stopped doing it and they really need to continue to do that. 